I might be butchering your words, but it was something like it caused a mild uprising in Belarus. Holy shit, how do you remember that? Good evening, dear viewer. My name is Taylor D. Adams with Scraps Productions, and today we are at Watson Ward in downtown Raleigh for another episode of Drinking While Interviewing. I am joined this lovely evening by co-owner and filmmaker and friend, Patrick Shanahan. How are you, man? I'm doing great. <laughs> I'm it's doing good to good. see you. Yeah, you as well. This is, a, this is a really cool place. Thank you. Thank you. I was living in New York about five, six years ago um, and spent a lot of time in these underground bars and realized that there wasn't a lot like that in Raleigh. I mean, you've got great places like Foundation, Sea Grace is practically underground. Um, but there's just something that happens to someone's psyche, I feel like, when you're away from the city and you kind of disappear, where you can kind of be someone that you're not always, or you can explore yourself a little more. And I think there's like a, there's an interesting thing that happens with the cocktail culture where you're exploring new tastes and uh, new things and there's an educational side of it. And I feel like the more you can learn about your environment and, and what you're putting into your body and also who you are, it's kind of, it, it creates an experience. And I knew that I wanted to build something like that. Well, for being, being open for a full year, you guys are going into a new summer and we've got a brand new drink to celebrate the occasion. We are drinking the Bourbon Bramble, consisting of bourbon, blackberry shrub, fino sherry, and plum bitters, quite possibly the fanciest drink we've had here on Drinking <laughs> While Interviewing. Uh, Fantastic. Cheers. Cheers to that. Yeah, well, we're really excited about the new menu. We uh, were joined by a guy named uh, Daniel Barnes not too long ago. He came in from D.C. and took over our bar program. and He's really uh, educated me and the whole crew a lot and um, brought a, long of us, a lot of us along in this world, which um, it really takes an artist and a craftsman, a craftsman, I would say, to understand it and to be able to execute it like uh, Daniel's done such a good job at. So we're still con he does you know, educational classes twice a week with uh, our whole team. So it, it's like I said, it's constantly about education and pushing your taste and pushing your ideas a little further. So I'm excited for people to come in and, and try new drinks and, and enjoy the summer here. Well, this is delicious. It's absolutely, this is the first time I've had it. <laughs> um, it's, it's really great. Have there been any parallels between running something like this and being a filmmaker? A hundred percent. I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think that was the most interesting thing. So in terms of running the bar, I have a partner named Niall Hanley of the Hibernian Company. So Hibernian Company runs and manages the space and they do a great job with it. Um, but what my whole involvement was, was a lot of the design, you know, working closely with Niall on that. And um, the build out of this place was an absolute beautiful disaster. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you kind of have a time period and a time limit, if you will, and you're working with all these contractors. And I would say the, the closest parallels that I found were during that process. So there's the creative team, there's the actual physical build-out team, you know, it was kind of, there's a director's contractor, you know, and, and I think that that process really excited me because I really love the design side of this. It's like building sets. So when I, when I worked on this space and in my head of how I wanted it to be laid out and uh, working, like I said, closely with Niall, um, that's kind of how I approached it, was how would you build this atmosphere, this environment, and honestly, the coolest thing about it has been when you make a film, people get to enjoy it for like an hour and a half, two hours, but this is like a set that continues on forever. Like it's always sad to me when my team um, builds these gorgeous sets on these films and it, it is a team effort, but I'm really proud of the, what we've done with our films as far as sets. And then you gotta break it down and tear it down and it ends up in a storage unit or who knows what happens to it after that. But it's cool to see that this lives on and then like every person that comes here and their group of people kind of have this, like I was saying, experience. And that's kind of like their own little movie in a way. So it's something that I'm not directing, but creating an environment to put someone into and see how that plays out. Your work has kind of taken you all over the place. Yes. I mean, you've been all over the country filming, you've been, you've been overseas in some, in some instances. What has been the, the most trying experience while working abroad, in a sense? Well, I would say the most trying experience I have had, have had was uh, with Empirica, which was actually domestic. Um, and that was going across the country with an old 57 Chevy and a crew of about 10 guys and one girl. And um, man, it's, it's something that like when I, I start to talk about it, it's such a long story that I don't even really know where to begin except to say that, you know, car broke down, held up by Apaches, saved by Navajos, like just an experience that I can't ever really describe or explain. And it was like this thing that brought all that, that team of people, that team of filmmakers, so close. And some of them I still work with, some of them I don't. But when I see him, it's kind of like family. And I think that's, uh, I think when you, my problem is that all my films have tried, I don't, people are like, oh, it was so ambitious. I don't know if it was ambition. 
or if it was just like blind ignorance, I think, is like my <laughs> biggest problem. Like the first film we did was a historical time period, you know, a, a, you know, it was just way out of our element and especially our budget. You were just jumping in the deep end from, jumping from in the, the deep get go. End. Yeah, and I don't know why, like I didn't even care about that time period. I just really wanted to tell that story. And then the, the second one that I mentioned was the one where we drove across the country and to do a road film on shooting on 16 millimeter film, it was, uh, yeah, it was brutal, especially with what we had to work with, so. I feel like the trying, most trying times are the most rewarding, you know, because oh, then the next yeah. time you're like, oh, we can practically do anything and get away with it now, so. So you graduated from North Carolina State here in Raleigh. State, yes. And then you went to film school in New York. Yes. Why film school? Well, it's interesting. My parents thought I was in school for political science. Um, I think it wasn't until like three or four semesters went by and they eventually saw like a, a, a status report card and uh, it said film on it and I think they were just shocked because uh, Political science just didn't really sit well with me. I come from sort of a political family and um, you know, a family of lawyers, and I, I expected that to be my path, but I was always a painter, and, and I was making films at the age of 16, like with my friends and stuff, like a lot of people say they do, but you know, we, we always, from the first thing I ever made with my friends, I was like, it's gonna be a feature film, and I was 16 with a little Canon handy cam. <laughs> I never like understood shorts, because they didn't have a place to go, and I always, which I think is interesting about my attitude towards film, mm -hmm. has always been, I started doing shorts later in my career because I was trying to do features because I knew they would have a life because mm -hmm. I've always been interested in reaching the audience and you know back then when we were 16 the internet wasn't exactly what it is now and audiences were trickier to find yeah. and um, so that's why film school I've, I've always been a storyteller and um, film has always been very dear to me ever since I saw pretty much Apocalypse Now when I was 16 and mm. grew up on Star Wars and all the greats and the fact that you can be transported into these other worlds I think was always really fascinating to me and I haven't really fully grasped how to do that to audiences yet but I'm learning so film school is the way to start that learning process. Speaking of being inspired by the greats, if you weren't having a drink with me right now, yes, of what, film, what filmmaker would you be having a drink with right now? Just two, the, to? the two Andersons. Wes Anderson and P.T. Anderson. <laughs> I think they're just modern day masters, artists, truly artists. Um, there's just such a control of the craft, which is something that, um, something I'm learning, you know, I, and I keep learning, and the bigger my team gets, I'm able to get a little closer but I mean, just what Wes Anderson's able to accomplish in one frame can, is, is sometimes equal to what many filmmakers accomplish in an entire film. And that's impressive. And then P.T. Anderson is just, um, you know, he just lays down masterpiece after masterpiece after masterpiece with such like ease and, and he's very humble and, and very relaxed and I, I like his style. So there's some, somewhere in between that like classic, epic, beautiful film that like P.T. Anderson does and then that artistic flair of like, like, perfection that Wes Anderson puts out I find myself like leaning towards those those realms and wishing and hoping that eventually I can find my own voice not to copy either one of them but you know Patrick yes thank you so much yeah for having me on the show man yeah cheers cheers to the thank you guys so much for joining us we'll see you guys next time on drinking while interviewing